It's a great pleasure to welcome Javier Solano to Harvard University. He's been here with us for several days. He's the former uh, High Representative of the European Union for Foreign and Security Policy. He's one of the uh, most experienced diplomats in the world. He's dealt with every conceivable issue under the sun. And Javier, I wanted to ask you first about, about Europe, about where you come from, about Spain and the European Union. You suffered this extraordinary crisis, the Euro debt crisis, which is also, in, in the eyes of many, um, also been a political crisis about the idea of Europe. Do you think as a result of what's happened, we're going to see the construction of an even stronger uh, center of the European Union in Brussels to support the Euro debt, the Eurozone? Uh, and, and what impact do you think this has had on the idea of Europe? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for your kind words, uh, Nick. Um, Europe has not gone through a crisis of these dimensions ever. Private crisis that the European Union didn't exist, and uh, therefore it's a new situation, and uh, we have to learn to take all the lessons. But to my mind, we will overcome this crisis with difficulty. But we will. We will be together with you and with other countries. And uh, at the end, I conceive the European Union more integrated, more integrated economically. And as a, as a consequence of that, more integrated also politically. This, again, is not a simple thing to do, but I think it's necessary between the two options, which is more integration of uh, breaking up. The second one is really bad. It's very bad from all points of view, for the vocation of Europe, of, of having a role in the world, even economically, if you take uh, account of uh, the cost of breaking up. Very hard. Therefore, I don't see any other outcome than uh, a more integrated uh, economically first, and as a consequence of that, politically. Does this mean, if, if you look at the countries that are not in the Eurozone, like Britain and Denmark and Sweden, we're looking at a two tiered Europe or a two track Europe? I think that uh, it's difficult to tell at this very moment. Uh, the question of the UK. Britain is a little bit different because they have said publicly they will never want to be in the euro. Never in politics doesn't mean much, but in any case they have said it very clearly. The other two countries that you mentioned, and other countries which are not still part of the euro, I think they have, or they will have a vocation if the, the situation evolves in the manner I said before, and with the growth and the uh, bulk of the crisis, I think will be a chance that they would like to join the Eurozone. And uh, if they don't, uh, it will be all the European Union at large. Imagine that uh, the European Union at large uh, it will be with the Balkans, countries incorporated. It will be a very big uh, number of countries around. And it's true that it will be at the center of uh, Eurozone number of countries that will have an avant-garde uh, mission to pull the, the European Union forward. Now, how both things are going to be related in order to have the legitimacy to, to act is something that is still is not completely clear, but I think the institutions will be the institutions of both, allow me to say, circles. And uh, that will give the legitimacy to act in any other field which is not related to the, to the strictly the Eurozone elements. Mm -hmm. uh, when I lived in Europe, um, uh, I was struck by how younger Europeans really felt they had an identity as Europeans. Now, they were, of course, they were Greeks, they were Spaniards, they were French, but they also felt more than previous generations that they belonged to a great, exciting venture called the European Union. And there's no question the European Union has been a great success, one of the great success stories of modern history. Has that feeling, that adherence to Europe, been, um, been weakened? by the doubts over the currency, and the arguments about how much power each country should give, give to Brussels? Well, I, I think that in general terms, uh, there's no much uh, uh, frustration of uh, lack of uh, passion for Europe. But uh, I would not say the truth or the whole truth if I would not recognize that the crisis is a crisis. And the unemployment is, is, is very high, that uh, problems uh, Related to the families is very high, and um, the cut in the budget is very important. And all that, uh, without a clear explanation, which I don't think the European institutions are giving, 
um, they may create a certain disappointment on some of the newer generations or the elder generation. Yeah. But I think that uh, the recovery of that sentiment uh, it will be done. Uh, the most important element for the, reco for the recovery of this sentiment is the recovery of the economy. Yes. Now, one thing that we have to do is to create a new narrative for the European Union. The European Union for the new generation, for the younger people, it cannot be the solution of a Europe that used to be at war, or every now and then, frequently. And uh, this is something that is not understandable by any young student, or young yes. professor, or young uh, European, because they live in peace, the, the level of standard of living is high, so we have to transmit uh, a new narrative that it cannot be other than the, the new world, the new world in which new powers are coming, coming up. And if we want to play a role that we should play, together with the United States and other countries, we have to act together. Uh, today, there are four countries of the European Union among the ten most important countries of the world economically. Yes. In ten years, will be three. In twenty years, will be two. In 30 years will be one, and in 40 years probably none. So this is a good message to say, well, you want that to happen or you want to act together and be Collective. that European part of this, at the top of the countries in the world. Huh? It will not be in the state, it never has a vocation to be in the state, but it would be a, a very complicated, maybe a still constitutional animal, but uh, efficient active and with a solid uh, vocation of being part of the world of the 21st century. Um, there's an unfortunate conventional wisdom developing in some parts of the United States and even of Asia that Europe is yesterday's story, that Europe is falling in power. I disagree. I think Europe matters greatly. Europe's the largest investor in the United States, the largest trade partner of the United States and has a large collection of American allies in the world, the 26 members of NATO that are in Europe. Um, do you think if the European Union does not strengthen itself, this conventional wisdom might actually be realized, that Europe will fall to a second-rate power in the world without a collective strengthening in Brussels? Well, I think so. If, if we don't, uh, if we don't uh, unite ourselves more, if we are not able to, uh, to do what I said before, to integrate further. First, in the economy, we have to be able to maintain a common currency with something else in goodwill. We need some measures that guarantee that the currency will be solid. I, I tend to say that uh, the euro has been a very successful story. And the good weather. When the weather is rough, we were not prepared to handle it in the same manner because the instruments were limited for the rough weather part of the trip. Right. But we will have, again, good weather. And, this is, and at that moment, uh, we will adapt ourselves, and we will be able to continue to play what, to my mind, is an important role in the world of the 20th century. I think we have, as you have said, a very vibrant economy. It will be again, not now, but it will be again in the US. We have good relation with uh, just about everybody in the world. I think our voice and our manner of doing things is appreciated by many countries of the world. And therefore, I think we have to continue being an important player in this complicated world in which we are entering the 21st century with a tremendous transfer of power yes. to emerging countries. Yes. Um, one of the issues that has, has bound us together is the issue of Iran, which is a very powerful state in the Middle East, but um, looking at a future of nuclear weapons there is, is is, is a major problem for both of us. You were the leader of the international negotiating effort on Iran. You represented China, Russia, the European countries, and the U.S. when you were high representative. Uh, we're on the verge of talks now. Your successor, Kathy Ashton, will lead those talks. Are you, are you hopeful that diplomacy can be, provide the answer to stop Iran from attaining, obtaining nuclear weapons and prevent a war? Well, I, I I trust uh, very much on diplomacy, as you do. I mean, we are both uh, active diplomats uh, uh, with successes and with failures, but uh, always with the faith or the hope that diplomacy, which is talking to the other, 
even if talk to the adversary, is fundamental to resolve problems. It's not going to be an easy negotiation. Uh, you have to know, know that. You yeah. have to know that. And it will not be short. Therefore, you have to be able to handle well your timing so that the pressure from Congress or pressure from other countries, etc., will not give enough time for the negotiation to come to an agreement on true fusion. But I think it's not impossible. Mm, I have the impression that uh, in uh, the last meeting that we have in Geneva, we were pretty, cl pretty close to a very important step that was destroyed by the Supreme Leader, but after we had agreed on it. So I think that uh, it's not an impossible, an impossible achievement, but um, patience has to be there, tenacity has to be there, and strength. I mean, we cannot give anything without uh, right. they doing something. Right, and the strength, of course, comes from the sanctions. It comes from the threat of uh, force by the United States, Israel. Are you also saying, as I hear this, that the United States needs to be patient? that we need to give enough time to these negotiations because we shouldn't expect to see progress in the first weeks. I don't think we will see progress in a very short period of time, weeks, no way, not even months, a number of months. Uh, I mean, the months probably will have to measure in units of 12, at least. But uh, we have to see that the, the, the negotiation moves on. But uh, the negotiation cannot be a uh, mechanism for the, to be used by the Iranians to continue gaining time. We know that already, that trick, and, and we are not going to play that trick. We shouldn't play that trick. Yes. So we have to be sure that uh, every time we meet together to negotiate, at the end of the meeting we have some progress. Well, at least the perspective of the progress. Right. If not, it would be very frustrating, and I think that uh, people will lose patience. Thank you. Final question. You are a great friend of the United States and a long-term time observer of the United States. You've been coming here for decades. We've had our own economic crisis, and we're having a national debate about whether or not we should stay engaged in the world, the leader of the world, whether we can. Some people predict that China will overtake the United States in global power in a, in a matter of decades. What is your view on that question, and what's your advice to Americans as we look at our own global role? Well, I, I'll, I'll give you my view. I don't know if I will be advised, because uh, to give advice to the United States is uh, too well, much, of a, a too much of a task. But uh, in any case, I think that the United States will continue to be a very important player. And I hope very much that that will be the case. I think the world needs a country with experience, uh, nation of the United States, with the power of the United States, uh, to be an active leader in the world. I think it would be a tremendous mistake if you withdraw from, from the first line of the foreign policy or international policy or security matters. Therefore, that is what I hope. Now, the second thing, it is true that the China uh, will increase their power economically, but uh, is not sufficient to be uh, the leading power. It's not only militarily what you have, or economically, that gives you the category of the, the, the responsibility of the big power, of the leading power. You have many, much more, or many more things that have to do with culture, that have to do with the so-called soft power that you have. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not easy that you are going to lose all that. Not easy. And I hope that will not take place. But it's true that it will be a redistribution of power in the world. We don't understand that. Uh, I think we don't understand anything of the world of the 21st century. Do you think that uh, there's no question this change is coming? China, India, Brazil, all rising to global power. Other countries, Turkey, taking on new roles. Do you think that the United States can maintain its position as the single strongest country, but obviously working together for global peace with the new countries? Well, I think that uh, we live in the interdependent world. Nobody can act alone. Uh, I think most of the problems that require a, a global solution, or at least the participation of many actors who solve the problems. Think about climate change, think about uh, resources which are scarce, uh, think about uh, many things which uh, come to our mind today. 
and none of them could be resolved by a country alone. Well, you have been able to create coalitions, uh, you have a coalition, or we have a coalition, which is a stable, with NATO, for instance, yes. and um, we will need probably different geometries. But I would like to, to, to stress also that uh, some uh, leadership on the United States on the global governance, global governance would be very welcome and very necessary. Agrathona, thank you so much for being at Harvard, and thanks for your comments today. Thank you very much. Thank you.